please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. This is where, if you're going to become a young tank crewman or work on an armoured vehicle, operator, gunner, etc., this is what it goes on. And to do that, we need instructors like uh, Chris here, um, and he'll tell you, yes, you do, you, come on, you said, nod your head. Um, and he'll tell you a little bit about what goes on and some of the other nerdy things that on these modern vehicles, we all see them, but do we know what's really going on there? What are they, why do they look like the way they do and what's uh, happening? And, uh, and I'm conscious of the time because if we don't start talking soon, we'll, uh, we'll run out, uh, go over into lunch hour. So the first vehicle we've got on is designed um, by a company not that far away from here, down in Honington, a Supercat. Uh, it's got uh, lovely little bits of newish technology from all over the place and it was to meet a requirement for a long-range reconnaissance vehicle that was going to be used out Af in Afghanistan. And uh, what we ended up with, this vehicle becomes called the Jackal. Uh, it's obviously, it's got a weapon station on the top that you could fit a, uh, a GPMG, a 50 caliber Browning, you can put a 40 millimeter grenade launcher on. Uh, again, another crew member there. And the idea is, you look at it, it's got fantastic all-round visibility. So that idea of using the human eye to see what's going on around you, hence the open top. Some form of armour protection there and a very clever suspension system. But you can tell me all about this. Oh, Roger. Um, so the suspension system uh, on the Jap is quite clever. Uh, it's, it's able to raise and lower. Um, so it's, it's three positions in a fully lowered position. Uh, it's all the pressures off the system. Uh, originally, it was designed by Supercat to fire from this position, so it gives it a, uh, a more stable platform. Uh, in the end, it didn't really work that way, so we normally fire it from the intermediate position, as you see now. Intermediate position is uh, what we use for uh, cross-country, and the fully raised position then is uh, what we do on motorway driving. Suspension is the, the stiffest, and travelling at 80 miles an hour down the motorway, you need uh, really stiff suspension. And this has got a long range, hasn't it? And that's the idea behind it. Yeah, it's got a range of uh, 800 kilometres, which is, you know, compare that to Challenger 2 on a good day, around about 550, it feeds into that strategically mobile uh, wheeled platform. Now, they also do a sixth wheel version of this, uh, whose name we couldn't remember the other day, but it's called a... Coyote. Coyote, we remember that now. Um, called a Coyote, and that can act as one of those supply vehicles as well. So when these guys are heading off, if they're going on a two, three day mission, um, deep behind enemy lines, etc., or in terrain, that's the other thing, the off-road capability of this as a wheeled vehicles. What we tend to say here is tracks will get you places wheels can't go, but that difference is, is closing up pretty much all the time. One of the few vehicles you can talk about when it drives past. Uh, well, I'm just mentioning that because every now and again he says, shut up and listen to the vehicle. Because in that case, it's so quiet. Imagine that for stealth on reconnaissance. Now, we're going back in time, it seems now, but to a vehicle still in service with the British Army. This is called the Scimitar. Now, the Scimitar part of that CVRT family of vehicles designed for British forces in the 60s. Uh, some of the older blokes here, you might remember, you had the Scorpion Action Man tank. This was part of that family. Instead of a 76 millimeter gun, it's got the Radon 30 millimeter cannon on it. Aluminium armor, fast speed, mob mobile for getting around the place, and that Radon kicks a bit of a punch, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. In the 30mm uh, cannon uh, world, the Radon is probably one of the most accurate 30mm cannons out there. Easily capable of dealing uh, with its threats that it needs, so its target set is usually uh, things like BMP2s, uh, BRDMs, etc. So it's, it's more than capable than that. The HE round is very effective. Uh, we teach that it's like throwing a hand grenade five kilometres. Now originally the Scimitar had the engine from the Jaguar E-type sports car. That was later replaced with a Cummings diesel engine that's in there at the moment. Still in service, went into service 1972. Uh, the Scimitar will probably be soldiering on for about another year for a while yet. So 
Next vehicle on, the big one in front of us, this is the Warrior. It was the armoured personnel carrier that was designed to replace the 432 uh, that again is still in service, that boxy vehicle. This is a whole new ball game though, because look, it's got the Raden turret on the top, again an aluminium hull, uh, it's speedy. Again, you've got a power pack in that that gets this vehicle around the battlefield very quickly. And it was one of the uh, benefits of the Warrior that it was so powerful that in later campaigns where we need to add extra armour to the vehicle, it didn't really bog it down and affect its uh, mobility. And again, this is a vehicle now going to go out of service. It'll be going out of service in a couple of years' time. We, you may have been following, there was a Warrior replacement programme, new turret, 40mm gun. Fairly recently, that's been axed. We've actually got the prototype vehicle down here at the museum, uh, and Warrior is going to be replaced by a wheeled vehicle called Boxer. Um, which will be starting to be built in Britain. Um, you may remember we actually had a boxer here a couple of years ago from the Dutch Army. Um, but the whole thing about Warrior, that engine, giving it the speed, not only to keep up with Challenger 1 and then Challenger 2 on the battlefield, but speed as well as a defence mechanism. So for the infantry in the back, the fact they moved like lightning to where they were needed, debus out the rear door, finish the attack on foot and with a 30 millimeter rod and cannon that's quite a bit of suppressing fire that goes down on top of it. That's what makes the uh, Warrior and Armoured Infantry uh, unique among sort of the, the APCs etc is that operational tempo. Armoured warfare is all about operational tempo so if the guys are taking the time mounting up, dismounting etc uh, you lose that tempo and therefore you lose the battle that's what's unique about Warrior. And it may well be that we're always um, talking about things like that uh, scimitar that's over there, the scimitar one um, we have a Scimitar 2 in service at the moment. We're waiting for Ajax. That's going to be the next big recce vehicle. And if you've read in the press, they've got problems with it at the moment. It'll probably come in the end. We may be using Warrior as a reconnaissance ve vehicle meanwhile, because it's so fast and very agile. Just adding to that about the, uh, the, the CVRT going out of service, uh, reconnaissance has changed over the last decade. It's no longer uh, feasible to conduct reconnaissance through stealth, so we're seeing a shift towards a, a heavier vehicle, better protection, better firepower, and that's where, where Ajax comes into play. So I mentioned about speed, mobility. You can see it going on there as these vehicles uh, tear around the arena. We obviously, with our historic collection, even though we could sometimes drive them a bit faster, we're trying to preserve them. This lot, um, they're in-service vehicles, the spare parts within reason are available, therefore the soldiers can drive them as they do. The driver was told off yesterday to go too fast, so I'm just egging him on. Now one thing we point out down here as well is vehicles that you see in training look very different when they go off to, into combat. So these are almost the vehicles in their naked state. And just mentioning there, Chris mentions about when you add on armour to vehicles. Think of yourselves, if you're 10 stone in weight, add another 10% weight to you um, and that's going to weigh you down a bit and that will slow you up. And that's exactly what happens as well with armoured vehicles where what ends up happening is if we put too much extra armour, extra bits on them, it ends up making them that much slower or they wear out quicker. So what, we, uh, what they try and do is if you add armour, hence bar armour because it's like a cage, it's thinner, it's lighter than adding blocks of whether it's steel or nowadays reactive or laminate armours as well. That's one of the other things that you always have to think about. The bigger the weight on that vehicle, the slower it's going to get. So coming in now we have a, uh, a Foxhound and a Mastiff, uh, Mastiff being an MRAP, so uh, mine resistant, ambush protected. Uh, these are very much bore out of the uh, Iraq and Afghan conflicts. Uh, the vehicle in front, uh, the Foxhound, that's a, a, a 
development cycle that took 10 years. Uh, it's state-of-the-art vehicle. It's taken a lot of uh, materials and engineering expertise from the Formula One and aerospace industry. So for example, the, uh, the hull is of a, a monocoque construction. Uh, not much metal in there, that's all composite materials to keep the weight down. Um, it's, it's a very uh, effective and reliable uh, patrol vehicle. And if you look at it when it drives past, the Foxhound, that's that first smaller vehicle, it's got a V-shaped hull. And again, we used to call it mines nowadays, they call them IEDs as well, same thing. Something buried in the road that's going to blow up when you go over it, or triggered nowadays by, another, uh, by somebody else. That V-shaped hull you'll see on Saracen, Saladin, it's not a new idea, but the point behind it, when the blast goes off, you don't want it captured under your vehicle because it might slip you over. So if the blast goes up the side, you're going to survive, and that's very important. On the Mastiff, sacrificial boxes. It doesn't matter if they blow off. As long as the crew are okay inside the vehicle, that's all that matters. And again, you can see that bar armour, those cages, around the outside of the vehicle, as well as a weapon station on top. Uh, sticking with the uh, protection of the Mastiff, um, the wheels, etc., are designed to, to fly off as well to keep that V-shaped hull uh, intact. Uh, and it really does do what it says on the tin. In Afghanistan, they were hitting some absolutely monstrous IEDs, and the crews were just coming out slightly battered and bruised. So it really does what it says on the tin. So crew survivability, again, it's another one of these things. You look through the history of armoured vehicles, there's some where it looked like they didn't give a monkeys about the crew. And again, we're in an age now where obviously making sure the lads come home is so important. So that idea of the protection levels on some of these vehicles, and, and look at the way they've grown. We all talk about miniaturisation, but these vehicles seem to get bigger and bigger all the time because of that protection we have to put on them. Uh, and again, with this Mastiff here, if you look in our Afghan display, you'll see people who've served on them, the stories. And with a lot of what was called UORs, urgent operational requirement, it was literally one week out in theatre, there would a message come back. I spoke to one of the guys who was working on Mastiff. He got a phone call on a Saturday morning from live phone call from Afghanistan. That week they worked on a mod on the vehicle. The following week they were sending out those modifications. So that's how we can do it sometimes if we need to. What seems to happen though is when the vehicles come back in fleet, uh, we seem to slow down somewhat. Yeah, you, you can compare and contrast that procurement cycle of UOR uh, with some of the uh, core procurement cycles we see. So, you know, some vehicles taking the best part of a decade to come into service. And I think that's a lot to do with risk, trying to keep the risk down and get the vehicle right in the first place. But sometimes it's just a good thing to get it in quickly and fix it later. Are we keeping Mastiff in service? Is it going to be in service or is it one of these ones only for that campaign? Uh, no, that's come core as well. Uh, Mechanised infantry use this um, and they're going to keep using this until Boxer rolls out as well. So we're going to see a, a large fleet of Boxer. The Tank Museum is a registered charity and every purchase you make from our online shop directly supports our work. We ship worldwide and if you subscribe to our email list, we'll give you 10% off your next order. When you finish this video, go to tankmuseumshop.org and you'll find something you never knew you needed. So when you see uh, Foxhound drive past, an interesting feature on Foxhound is that its suspension system runs horizontally around the outside of the hull. So if you look at the, the, black, bear, the, well, the black bar running on the outside of the hull, that's its uh, torsion bar suspension. What it means is the armour isn't compromised by having suspension parts going into the hull, uh, causing weak spots. Now you might wonder what these little boxes on the front of some of these vehicles are, and you can see some now they've got mounting on cameras, some are what they call ECM equipment, electronic countermeasures. Uh, now obviously we'd love to tell you all about what's in those boxes, but then we'd have to kill you afterwards. Obviously it's still top secret, they, we don't want to let the bad guys know what these vehicles are capable of. So those are the sorts of things as well. I know it sounds obvious, when you go and talk to the soldiers later on, they'll be at a point, but they're not just trying to sort of like um, fob you off. They just, obviously, we don't want the bad guys to know exactly what all these vehicles can do. The armour on Challenger, still officially secret. Um, and uh, that's part and parcel of the game, that there's no point giving everything away until you really have to. Yeah, the Foxhound came into service with the uh, 
uh, light mechanised infantry, which is kind of a new new formation of, of strategically mobile light infantry. Um, full crew in the back, armed with two GPMGs. An interesting point as well, it's got four wheel steering on it, which means the rear wheels can turn as well. The idea being that if they're in a, a built up area and they need to uh, turn the vehicle around in a small alley, you can. It's a surprisingly uh, agile vehicle. Now again, even though with all these new vehicles, much of the training for them going on down here at Bovington, um, do we still need a tank though in the British Army? That's a question that again comes round time and time again. We were having an interesting conversation. We're going to bring on a challenger in a moment. Um, one of the things about, uh, if you read the press, all of a sudden there'll be a tank's knocked out somewhere, the end of the tank, the tank day is over. You've got a drone, it's taken out a tank. That's the end of the tank. Look at the history in that museum over there. It's a consistent history of the end of the tank. And yet for some reason, there's another use for these big heavy armored vehicles. And one of them just came out, we were talking, the fact this thing can fire a metal dart that nothing can stop probably means we're going to want them because it's not a, a, a system that can be stopped at all. Uh, yeah, active protection systems. We've, we've seen this. Uh, I'm going to be quiet now because you won't be hearing me anyway. <laughs> I stepped out of the way because I know who's driving that. Um, yeah, I was mentioning the, uh, the, the, the pushing the pendulum, we call it. There's, there's always a, an action and a counter action. We uh, develop high explosive anti tank rounds. Later on, we develop composite armor to counter that. The tank then comes back into play. Uh, recent years, we've had uh, anti tank missile systems, uh, which are deadly for armored vehicles. But the new, newer technology out there, active protection systems that can shoot down these missiles, uh, mean that now the tank is going to be at the forefront of, uh, of armoured warfare, of warfare, uh, for, for many years to come. There's a, there's a saying as well, saying that uh, a tank is like a tuxedo. You uh, very rarely need a tuxedo, but when you need one, only a tuxedo will do. And that, that's very true for the main battle tank. So this particular Challenger 2, this is the one that comes from up the road at ATDU, the Armoured Trials and Development Unit, and basically it's got everything on it that might be put on a tank if it goes out to fight in theatre. So it's got the Barracuda camouflage system on. Tell us about that when it's moved on. Barracuda uh, camouflage system is originally intended to uh, mask the vehicle's thermal signature. Um, a lot of uh, armoured warfare now is conducted at night, uh, so the lower the uh, thermal signature, the uh, better chance you've got of uh, remaining undetected and getting that, that shot off. But it also has a, a, an added benefit. Uh, we got this issue to us while we were in uh, Iraq and it reduced the uh, temperature inside the vehicle to a more sort of bearable standard, so we were, we were grateful of that. And there, what you've just seen as well, it puts diesel on its hot exhaust and that creates that smoke screen. So it can fire out smoke grenades, creates a, uh, what's it called nowadays? Oh, it's a multi-spectral smoke grenade. Sm multi-spectral <laughs> smoke grenade. You can't see through with lots of different things, but it also can do that. And again, it hides you from the enemy. Simple things that are still very useful. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's also good for hiding, um, but we've also found that if we're going to put a, a deception in, if you put one of these on a, or behind a hill and, and, and run it smoke generators, the enemy doesn't know how many vehicles are there, so they, they end up sort of, uh, taking that as a deception, so it's a, it's a good, good tool to have. And the other point that we always try and make when we're here, when this thing goes past, you won't hear me, but think of yourself as an infantryman in a trench, and this is coming towards you. One of the things about tanks, they have a certain symbolic power as well as having that fear factor. And that's true right from the very first tank attacks. We've got the Mark I in there in our trench display right to the modern era today. Look at this thing, it's very frightening. fear factor principle, uh, especially on night operations where sound travels further, uh, hearing a squadron of Challenger 2s 
uh, it, it's quite disconcerting. You see them, uh, or you feel them, and you hear them uh, way before you see them, and you really don't know which direction they're coming from. So it gives you that sort of tank terror feeling. And with Challenger 2, so you know, we're now moving on to Challenger 3. It's going to have a new turret, a new gun. You've seen that new gun, quite an impressive bit of kit. And that'll be being built in Britain. Uh, not as big a fleet, probably about 100, 150 tanks, something on those 140 lines. we're looking at. Yeah, so they will be in service. So the idea that uh, certainly the British Army has not said that the tanks hold hand. I mentioned yesterday that uh, you can always judge an armoured vehicle by how it looks. If it looks mean, uh, it looks the part, it really is going to be effective. And I think Challenger 2 really does look like a mean piece of kit. One of the things of Challenger, the Challenger 1, Challenger 2, it's got laminate armour. What you're looking at on the outside is a skin of a vehicle. Uh, underneath is where that secret armour is in what they call armour packs. They can't bend it. That's one of those reasons modern tanks tend to have that flat, faceted look to them. Now, we're just going to finally bring you one Challenger variant on, and this is what's dragged out if your tank breaks down. This is a Challenger Armoured Repair and Recovery Vehicle. Now what you get with this vehicle is actually underneath it is a Challenger 1 hull that they put the Challenger 2 running gear in. They build up the superstructure, you've got a lovely dozer blade ground anchor on the front, a winch, you've got a crane on the back so you can do pack lifts, in other words the engines out of other vehicles and you can carry a spare or tow behind you a trailer with spare engines in. Um, but an impressive bit of kit, isn't it? It looks apart again as well, doesn't it? It is a pretty scary looking vehicle, a little bit ugly, but she's got a great personality. Uh, talk about that winch then. Um, the, the winch in the front is able to pull 50 tonnes uh, straight off, uh, but if you put a, uh, an extra pulley in there, it's, it's able to lift 100 tonnes. It shows you the, uh, the force that can pull. Once it digs its uh, blade in, it can really pull a, a lot of weight. Again, different types of armour protection. This one's got the bar armour added, you can see round the rear, rear, and reactive armour on the sides. Yep, it's RAP2 developed uh, for the, uh, the Iraq uh, campaign. Uh, it's an explosive reactive armour, and uh, the idea is to defeat uh, heat warheads. Uh, it's perfectly capable of stopping an RPG, which is what its main threat was. One of the big things that, again, for modern vehicles, they're bound to be used, you know, they train on Salisbury Plain or Battus, Truth is, they're likely to be used in urban or semi-urban, hence the need to put protection now all around the vehicle rather than the old Cold War days. You knew the enemy was over ahead of you um, and therefore the main protection of the armour was on the front. Now he, the guy might be jumping out the street behind you with an RPG. You need protection the whole way round. Hence the bar armour and that extra armour. And they're even putting armour on the tops of vehicles now as well. Yeah, the uh, best thing about the uh, craft having all this armour means that uh, if during a contact a vehicle does get immobilised, uh, it can get right into the firefight and recover that vehicle without having to wait for the, uh, for the battle to be over. Was, uh, crewed by Remy, a special breed of Remy, the Recky Max. Uh, secretly, they want you to be bogged in so they can come and uh, get you get you out. Uh, they're a strange breed, people who like to wade up to their waist in mud and, and play with chains, etc.
you mentioned earlier about uh, using armored vehicles in urban operations. Um, and the craft, because it's organic to the tank squadron, as in it's permanently attached to the tank squadron, if there is a small obstacle to clear, such as a burning car in the street, uh, it's easier just to call on the Rimi with the craft to clear that obstacle than it is to put a request up to hire for a dedicated engineering vehicles. So it really is a, a massive force multiplier for urban ops. And again, you tend to protect these vehicles because, again, your engineering assets, vehicles like this, are going to be very precious to you. Yes, what you do is you have a, a critical target list you issue to all your, all your tank crews to say, if you see this vehicle, you need to kill that. For example, if you see a bridging asset, that's the top of the list. Because as soon as you take out the enemy's bridges, they cannot cross rivers.